ان الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله ارسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وان كل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد اقول اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ربنا هب لنا من ازواجنا وذرياتنا قرة اعين واجعلنا للمتقين اماما رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين It's an absolute joy to be back at the community once again alhamdulillah I've rarely had an opportunity to come back to New York since I've moved to Dallas but when I got stuck in traffic at the Throgs Neck bridge my eyes came to realize yes I really am in New York Alhamdulillah as I came back I was thinking about what to share with you in terms of today's khutbah and I wanted to keep it something very simple and easy to remember and inshallah ta'ala I decided that I would share with you just one small figure of speech one expression in the Quran something very small it's part of the ayah that I recited to you and it occurs in other places in the Quran and is also found in the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the small expression is qurrata a'yun the coolness of the eyes, the coolness of eyes. The ayah I recited to you from Surah Al-Furqan, in, in which Allah Azza wa Jal teaches us a dua, He teaches us a supplication. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنَ وَجَعَلَّا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا We ask Allah, our Master, grant us from our spouses and our children the coolness of eyes, and make us leaders over those who are righteous and pious and fearful. So we ask Allah to turn our, our spouses and our children into the coolness of our eyes. It takes a little bit of deeper look to appreciate what Allah is saying when He teaches us to ask to turn our families into the coolness of our eyes. What does that mean anyway? What does it mean for your eyes to become cool? To better understand this phrase, we have to travel to pre-Islamic Arabia. The Arabs used to use expressions among each other even before the Qur'an was revealed. And then the Qur'an used those expressions. And this is one of them. Back in the day, the, the Arab of that time would say two things. Either somebody's eyes have become cool or they have become warm. And to give it some context, one of the worst curses the Arab could say against somebody else would be, Allahu aynahu, may Allah make his eyes warm. In other words, may he suffer the worst kinds of sorrow and sadness and depression. May he shed tears of sorrow. If you want to translate it into a literary English equivalent, to shed tears of sorrow. And the exact opposite is the eyes becoming cool when you shed tears of joy. To help you understand that even simpler, you go to the airport and you see one family greeting someone they haven't met in a long time. One family is greeting the son and the other family is saying goodbye to the son, but they're both crying. But one of them, the one who's greeting the son, their eyes are cool. And the one who's saying goodbye, their eyes are warm. I hope that helps you understand the difference between the eyes becoming cool and the eyes becoming warm. But now let's move forward and understand one more thing about how this expression was used. One thing is of course tears of joy. And the other is that the Arab used to travel in the desert. And in the middle of travel there's a sandstorm. And in the storm he has to cover up his face. Now Allah created the camel, his vehicle, he created the camel in a way that its eyelids actually have a screen that traps sand and don't let it touch its eyelid and it drops down. It doesn't even have to blink. 
That's the creation of Allah. But we don't have that kind of security system on our eyes. So his eyes are getting a pounding. And he can't even cover his eyes. You know why? Because he, if he covers his eyes, he won't know where he's going. So in the middle of a sandstorm, his face is covered, but his eyes are being pounded with sand. He finally finds a cave or some refuge. And when he gets there, he says poetically, my eyes have finally become cool. My eyes have finally become cool. Qarrat aynayya. My eyes have become cool. What that expresses is that he has found refuge from a storm. So the two things I'd like you to remember about coolness of the eyes as far as the ancient Arabs are concerned, one it has to do with shedding tears of joy, being so happy that you're moved to tears. And the other it's associated with finding refuge, with finding some kind of safety. And now Allah tells us to ask Him to make our spouse and our children a means of coolness of our eyes. What does that mean? That means we should be so happy with our spouse. The husband should be so happy with the wife. The wife should be so happy with the husband. The parents should be so happy with the children that upon just seeing them, they are moved to tears of happiness. They, they should be that happy with their family. It also means that the outside world, when you go to work, when you go shopping, when you go outside and earn your living or whatever you do, the outside world is like a storm. But when you come home, you finally found refuge. You found the coolness of your eyes when you enter the house. This is a particularly relevant and also ironic dua. Because for most people, Muslim and non-Muslim, the storm is not outside the house. The storm is inside the house. People cool their eyes off not inside the home, but outside the home. They come home and the yelling and screaming begins. They go to work and they are all smiles and happiness. And the non-Muslim secretary, you say, Hi, how are you? How's your day? Glad to hear it. How was your weekend? You don't say that to your wife though. You come home and, you know, she asks, how was your day? I don't want to talk about it. I had a long day, okay? Just leave me alone. Right? The same thing with the wife. You're harsh to each other. You're easily, you lose your temper easily with your children. The house becomes a place of tension and unrest. Constantly trying, th finding things to complain about and whine about and yell at each other about and make lists of things by calendar date what you have done wrong. Remember on the 3rd of January you said this? I have record. And you bring it up over and over again. You don't forgive. You don't let go. So Allah Azza wa asks us, if you really want peace, you have to find that peace inside the house. Let's see where, by the way, this is not the topic of my khutbah. The khutbah is the expression itself and where it's used in a particular hadith. But we'll get to the hadith at the end, inshaAllah. Let's see where else this expression is used in the Quran. You know Musa alayhi salam, when he washed up and Asiya picked him up. When she picked him up, by the way, this woman, the wife of Fir'aun, she's in a very problematic relationship. She's in a relationship with one of the worst human beings that ever lived. And she is in a relationship where you know nowadays you say there's a married couple and they're in an abusive relationship. She can call the, hot, the hotline or she can call the domestic violence hotline or call the cops or complain to the government or find a shelter. She can't do any of that. Now we don't know if there's physical abuse, but the Quran does testify at the very least that there's psychological abuse. So, and sometimes psychological abuse is worse than physical abuse. So much so that she asks Allah, she can't go to anyone else. She can't complain to the government because he is the government. She can't go to the cops because he owns the cops. He can't, she's got nowhere to go. So the only place she can turn is to Allah and she says, min fir'auna wa amali in Surah Al-Tahreem. She says, rescue me from Fir'aun and the things that he does. Now this woman is in a storm. But when this baby washes up and she picks him up, Musa alayhi salam, she says, Qurratu aynin li, walak. He will be the coolness of my eye for me and for you. Now when she says for you, it's referring to Fir'aun. We'll come to that in a second. But let's understand what does it mean to, uh, for her eyes to become cool? When a mother doesn't have a child, and she cannot have a child, and all of a sudden she's gifted with a baby. You ever seen a mother with a baby? She forgets the rest of the world exists. Those of you that are married, when you were just you and your wife, it was different. When the baby came, she's a mother first and a wife second. She, you could be talking to your wife and all of a sudden in the other room she hears a little bit of an eh, just a little bit of that and you don't exist anymore. She goes and her world changes. There could be all kinds of problems. There could be you can't pay the rent, there's no electricity, there's no food in the fridge. But when she's playing with her baby, she's found refuge from a storm. This is her escape. This is her refuge. She's in a very depressing situation. Now she's finally found something that cools her eyes because the rest of, the, the rest of her life is there to warm her eyes. You understand that expression I gave you? 
Right? SubhanAllah. But she also said, He'll cool your eyes too to Fir'aun. Now what's amazing is she didn't say, Qurratu Aynin Lana. He will cool our eyes. She didn't put herself next to Fir'aun. She separated him. Walak. Separated him. Because she doesn't want to associate with him in anything. Radiallahu anha. What does it mean though that his eyes will become cool? It's obvious. The guy's a genocidal maniac. He kills babies every other year. His Musa's presence alayhi salam will be enough to even calm that crazy person down. That's something special Allah gave Musa alayhi salam when he said, وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً minni." I have thrown upon you a special love that comes from me. You know the word hub in Arabic is love. The word hub is love. Mahabba is a hyperbolized form of love, extreme love. It's called maslar mimi in, in, in morphology. It's only used once in the Quran, it's only used for Musa alayhi salam, the love that Allah gave Musa alayhi salam. Hub is used 11 times. But mahabba only for Musa alayhi salam this once. Something special about this child. So this child is used to, the cool, to cool the eyes of this woman. But then when Allah Azza wa was telling Musa alayhi salam of his favors in Surah Taha, one of the favors done to Musa alayhi salam was, فَرَجَعْنَاكَ إِلَىٰ أُمِّكَ كَيْ تَقَرَّ عَيْنُهَا وَلَا تَحْزَنْ So we returned you to your mother, meaning your original mother. You know when they couldn't find anybody to feed this child, and his sister came along and said, هَلَّا دُلُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ مَنْ يَأْفُلُهُ should I tell you of someone who will take care of this child? And by means of that strategy, Allah reintroduced the mother who just put her baby in the water. Now you have to imagine, when she's putting her baby in the water, are her eyes cool or warm? You have to imagine that yourself. You can figure that out. But when Allah returns her to her child, you can imagine the joy, the, the tears of joy she's crying. And Allah counts that and expresses that by what expression? So her eyes could become cool. Same expression again. But even this is not my topic. This was just to give, it, give you an appreciation of how powerful this expression is. My real topic to you today is a hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But in order to understand and appreciate the beauty of those words in this profound hadith, I have to set the stage for you. You need a little bit of background. So I'd like you to pay close attention inshaAllah ta'ala, I think you'll appreciate it. A Messenger has to be engaged in two conversations. One conversation is with Allah. And the other conversation is with the people. Two conversations. A messenger communicates with Allah and communicates with the people. Let's, since we were just talking about Musa alayhi salam, let's just take his example to understand this better. Musa alayhi salam is on a road trip with his family, like many of you will be this weekend at the Ikna convention. He's on a road trip, huh? But he gets lost and he sees a flame and he tells his family to wait umkuthu inni anastu nara it is i who sees a flame now on a side note that's important because the way allah structured the language of the ayah he tells us nobody else could see the flame except musa alayhi salam it's not just not just anastu it's inni anastu he creates ikhtisas it is only i for sure that sees the flame now it's important because if it's in the middle of the night if anybody else sees a fire what are they naturally going to do they're gonna end up there. But he's the only one who's, en who's meant to be there. So only he sees it. And he goes there, and I'm skipping through the passage. When he gets there, he's called by Allah. Ya Musa. Ya Musa. Inni ana rabbuk. I am your master for sure. Take your shoes off. Allah Azza wa Jalla starts talking to him. Now first of all, when you go somewhere strange and somebody knows you by name, it's already a shock. But when they introduce themselves to you as someone very important, before I go further, appreciate that. Have you ever met someone very important, very famous, very powerful? A, you know, a celebrity even, right? When you meet someone like that, when you get to shake hands with someone like that, you say, man, I wish I had a camera. Or when you talk to somebody famous, you say, you know who I spoke to? You know who I got a chance to meet? You know who I talked to on the phone? You know who I ran into at the masjid, etc, etc? It becomes a burning memory in your life, you've met a celebrity. You've met someone important. Now put that in perspective. Who is Musa alayhi salam meeting? Who is introducing himself to Musa alayhi salam? This is the greatest honor ever bestowed on a human being that he's directly converse, conversing with Allah. This is one of the great moments in human history. He's conversing with Allah azza wa jalla. Now you have to imagine when you get a chance to meet somebody important, then the conversation doesn't last very long. When you meet someone important, they have other things to do and you know, you're, you, you're lucky to get 10 seconds. But Allah Azza wa Jalla starts conversing with Musa alayhi salam in great detail. He introduces, him, he introduces himself, gives him intro, introduction himself properly also again, إِنَّنِي أَنَ اللَّهِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَاعْبُدْنِي وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِي 
And he goes on and on. And then all of a sudden, Allah Azza wa Jal asks a very strange question to Musa alayhi salam. He says to him, وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَى What's that in your right hand, Musa? Allah Azza wa Jal, in the middle of this very serious conversation says, What is in your right hand? Now Musa alayhi salam is an intelligent person. He knows that Allah knows. He knows that Allah knows. He could just answer, Oh Allah, you know. What am I going to say? Anta a'lamu innaka a'lamu minni. You for sure know better than I do. He could just say that. He could just give one word answer. He could just say, Hadihi asaya. This is my staff. Allah asked, What is it? Here's the answer. This is my staff. But instead of, and the question is a one answer, one word question. The question is, What is it? And the answer is, It's a staff. And by the way, the younger folks here, when I say staff, you're thinking of people you hire. No, staff is a big stick. Okay? And I don't use the word cane because a cane is a sign of weakness. But a staff is a symbol of strength. They're two different things in English literature. So it's a staff, a large stick. Okay? Musa alayhi salam is asked, what's in your hand? He says, it's my staff. But he doesn't stop there. He says, atawakka'u alayha. I lean on it sometimes. Did Allah ask what you do with it? No. He says, wa ahushu biha ala ghanami. I beat on bushes with it so my sheep can eat. I beat on bushes with it. Did Allah ask? No. What's Musa alayhi salam doing? He wants the conversation to last. He's got an opportunity of a lifetime. Actually of many lifetimes. Who gets the chance to converse with Allah? He doesn't want to hang up that quickly. So he wants to keep it going. So now the thing is though, how many things are you going to come up with about a stick? How long are you going to talk about a stick anyway? So you say, أَتَوَكَّأُ عَلَيْهَا وَأَهُشُّ بِهَا عَلَىٰ غَنَمِي And you run out of things to say. I got no more I can come up with. So he says, out of desperation, alayhi salam, he says, وَلِيَ فِيهَا مَآرِبُ أُخْرَىٰ I've got other benefits that come from it too. <laughs> There's other stuff I can do with it also. SubhanAllah. It illustrates the love and the desperation that he has to keep wanting to talk to Allah. But then Allah Azza wa Jal, as the conversation goes on and he shows him the miracles, he says to him, now that you've had the most beautiful conversation of your life, get ready. اِذْهَبْ إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ طَغَىٰ Go talk to Fir'aun. Go to Fir'aun, he's rebelled. Now Fir'aun is, if you look at the conversation between Musa alayhi salam and Fir'aun, it is one of the most insulting conversations you will ever read. One person in the course of one conversation comes up with multiple insults. You ingrate, I raised you as a child, you're a liar, you deny what you did, you're, you're not telling the truth, you are a magician, you're insane. I mean, he comes up with a bunch of stuff in one conversation. Do you think anybody enjoys being insulted? All of you are respectable people. When you go to work, you expect to be treated with respect. That's what you expect. But if some, one of your co-workers comes up to you and starts cursing you out and your family and calls you a liar and calls you, you know, all kinds of names. They didn't hit you with their hand. They didn't cut you with their sword or shoot you with their gun. All they use is hurtful words. You know what would happen to you? You probably walk out of work or not eat lunch that day, and when you come home, your, your wife will say, what happened to your face? They say, I don't want to talk about it. You would shut down mentally. You would shut down because respectable people, when bad language is used towards them, it hurts them a lot. It wears down on them. It burdens them. Now, if you're not a respectable person, and you're part of the scum of society, then filthy language is totally okay for you. You will hear it all day and it will not, mess, it will not you know, make any effect on you. And by the way, as you're listening to this, if you have become accustomed to foul language, think about what you've become. Think about how dignified you are yourself. If foul language comes out of your mouth without a second thought, and you listen to it, it doesn't irk you at all. It doesn't bother you at all. That what you've just heard is a piece of filth. It doesn't bother you at all. It says something about your own dignity and how much respect you have for yourself. Anyhow, Musa alayhi salam goes to Fir'aun and it's the ugliest conversation. He's gonna get all kinds of accusations. All kinds of accusations. To put this in perspective, to tie the whole khutbah together, when he speaks to Allah, his eyes are becoming cool. But when he speaks to the people, when he speaks especially to Fir'aun, it is a necessary consequence that the eyes will become warm. It is a necessary, all messengers, all messengers, when they deal with the people, they hear hurtful things. Even the most respectful of them, the most noble of them. Nuh alayhi salam is talking to the same bunch of people. Now, to, again, I like to put things in perspective for you. If one of you got up right now and started cursing me out and my family out, and started calling me all kinds of names, what would I do next? I'd probably drop the mic and get out of here. Let's go, we're leaving. Back to Texas for me. 
And somebody calls me, hey, when are you coming back to Bashar? I ain't coming back. Is that guy still there? You know that guy who got up and did whatever he did? I'm not coming back until he moves. Do the messengers have that luxury? Some guy gets up and insults the messenger of Allah. He says, that's it, I'm moving to Taif. I'm out of here. Off to Medina for me. Does he have that luxury? Does Nuh figure, no, time for the next town. I've overstayed my welcome after one speech. No. The next day he comes back, not even a different crowd, it's the same crowd of people. And if the guy was obnoxious the first day, you can only imagine the next day. <laughs> and you can only imagine the day after that, he's spending centuries with the same bunch of people. And they get so nasty with him, that he walks by and he describes, They pull their clothes in and cover their face, like ah! Oh. Like they can't stand his smell, or they, they'll be disgusted by the fact that he would touch them. They would treat him like that. He doesn't stand there and say, who do you think you're talking to? I am a messenger of Allah. You don't know what my dua can do. He doesn't do that. He's continuously conversing with the people. Enough reason for anybody's eyes to become warm. Now you're ready for the hadith. The hadith I told you about cooling the eyes. The messenger of Allah says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, جُعِلَتْ قُرَّةُ عَيْنَيَّ فِي الصَّلَةِ The coolness of my eyes was placed inside the prayer. When the Messenger وسلم, stands to make salah, who is he conversing with? Allah. And when he converses with Allah, his eyes become cool. He sheds tears of joy. He regains his strength. He revitalizes and re energizes. And now that he's re energized and revitalized, he goes back to give da'wah to the people. And the people say hurtful things that make his eyes warm. Now he has to cool them again. And what does he come back to? The salah. He re energizes with salah again. The salah is the, the refuge of the messenger sallallahu alaihi Compare that. Compare a mother losing her child and finding it again, and Allah says her eyes have become cool. And Allah's messenger says, that coolness of the eyes I, found when I, I find when I make salah. I find when I make salah. Now compare that salah to your salah and my salah. What has happened since then? For a lot of us, the salah has become an obstacle in our day. It's kind of, it gets in the way. God, it's time again. I have some really other important things to do and it's kind of you know, hampering my schedule. I have to pull over for it. Or I have to, I'm in the middle of a really important project and I have to you know, pause it, hit save, and then go in the copy machine room and make salah and still think about the project while I'm standing. My mind is still there. Just get it over with. A lot of us make salah like hit and run. Right, you hit the floor a couple of times, get out of here. Get it over with. Right? I'm not even talking about the obligation of making salah. I'm talking about the, the gift that Allah gave to the Messenger wasallam. This was a gift to him. He had a very difficult job and he needed, he needed something that would strengthen him. The Messenger was in need of something that would strengthen him. So Allah Azza wa Jal told him in Surah Al-Muzzammil to stand up and pray half the night. Or a little less or a little more. And in the next surah, now that he's regained his strength, Ya ayyuhal muddathir qum fa'andir. Go and warn. Rise and warn people. Do the other part. Subhanallah. He tells the believers themselves, Ista'inu bis sabri wa salah. Ista'inu bis sabri. Seek help from sabr, not only from sabr, from salah. From salah. This is supposed to be something that helps us. This is supposed to be something that cools our eyes. That is what salah is supposed to be. I mentioned all of this for you for two reasons. One that all of us make a commitment to take better care of this gift that Allah gave us, this prayer, this salah. This is not something trivial, this is something very important. And I, I, I wanted to mention one slight side thing about salah before I tell you the second thing I wanted to mention, the concluding thing, is the following. You know when Musa salam introduced himself to Allah? Or Allah introduced himself to Musa salam. Do you think the Musa salam will ever forget this conversation happened? You meet someone famous, you never forget. He just met with Allah, he spoke with Allah, he's never gonna forget. He will never forget. But even he who will never forget, Allah told him, Innani an Allah, la ilaha illa ana, fa'budni wa aqimi salata li dhikri. It is I, no doubt, Allah. There is no one to be worshipped and obey except myself. Then enslave yourself and worship me. And listen to this part establish the salah so you can remember me. The one who will never forget, Allah tells even him, if you really want to remember me, you better establish salah. Salah is the real way to remember me. SubhanAllah. 
The final thing I wanted to share with you is about da'wah. Is about spreading the message of Islam. One of the purposes of this khutbah is to tell you that what happens in salah is necessarily connected to what happens outside salah. The two things are connected. If your salah has become empty, if your salah has become meaningless, then your da'wah will also become meaningless. The salah is the way you energize and become, you connect to Allah and you really feel, what you, the, the, you appreciate the treasure Allah has given you in this deen. And when you appreciate that treasure, you're able to deliver it to someone else with a genuine sincerity. And when a sincere heart gives da'wah, then the Allah puts effect in that da'wah. Otherwise, it's just impressive words. It's just, you know, words on a mic. And you could, you could be impressive with that, but it won't carry any barakah, any effect. If we want our da'wah to really have the oomph, that strength, that energy, then the internal has to be changed, and then the external. And this is the balance Allah Azza wa Jal gave us in this deen. You concern yourself with your own shortcomings, at the same time you work on the problems of society and declare the message. These are two things that go hand in hand, and you cannot take one and give it priority over the other. They go hand in hand, subhanAllah. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us an appreciation of the legacy of all of His messengers, and a newly found love and appreciation particularly of the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and especially of salah may allah give us coolness of the eyes from our spouses and our children rabbana hab lana min azwajina wa dhurriyyatina qurrata a'yun waj'alna lil muttaqina imama barakallahu li wa lakum fil qur'an al hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyyakum bil ayati wa dhikri al hakim الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا. Move up and squeeze together as much as you can. There are people outside. And head downstairs as well. There's more space. الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمدا رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استقيموا يرحمكم الله make your lines as straight as you can if you have cell phones please sure they're, make sure they're turned off <coughs> Allahu Akbar Bismillah. 
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين هل أتاك حديث الجنود فرعون وثمود بل الذين كفروا في تكذيب والله من ورائهم محيط بل هو قرآن مجيد في لوح محفوظ الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا ضالين آمين والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله <تصفيق>